It is spring 238 BC, nearly two and a half thousand years ago. In a dim temple, a nine-year-old boy grasps his father's hand and repeats what he is told to say. He will hate the Romans for as long as he lives. Hannibal was conducted to an altar and having laid his hand on the offerings was bound by an oath to prove himself as soon as he could an enemy of the Roman people. Hannibal drove the Romans to the brink of despair and defeat. His genius was such that even today his battle tactics are studied in military colleges around the world. Thousand years ago, a man called Hannibal of Carthage crossed the Alps with tens of thousands of mercenaries and 37 elephants in the middle of winter. His mission was to destroy Rome. He spent 16 years on enemy soil and devoted his entire life to battle against the Romans. But who was Hannibal Barca? Hannibal is a, a curious character historically. We we know quite a lot about Hannibal as a general, as a as a leader, and, and indeed as a as a politician. We know very little about Hannibal the man. Compared to say Alexander the Great, we we know very little about his family, uh, about his tastes, uh, about the sort of things he enjoyed. We're not even sure exactly how Hannibal appeared. Aged only 25, Hannibal was already in command of a huge army. His father had been a great general who had made his name in battle between Carthage in North Africa and Rome. Carthage, in what is now modern-day Tunisia, was the dominating power of the Western Mediterranean for nearly six centuries. A brutal force, the Carthaginians fought the Romans in a series of battles known as the Punic Wars, which lasted for over 100 years. This was a bitter and bloody struggle as both sides fought for control of territory. The young Hannibal had been raised in an atmosphere heavy with hatred and loathing for his people's most bitter enemy. He was the obvious choice to lead the Carthaginian army, now stationed in a settlement in modern-day Spain. Hannibal was adored and respected by his men. As their commander, he was prepared to undergo hardships side by side with his soldiers. Many have seen him wrapped in a military cloak lying on the ground amid his soldiers. His dress was not at all superior to that of his equals. He was at once by far the first of the cavalry and infantry and foremost to advance to the charge, the last to leave the engagement. To succeed at that age, you needed brilliance. You needed charisma, you needed a skill with men, you needed personal bravery to demonstrate to men double your age, much more experienced, that you were the man to lead them. You needed luck, um, and quite possibly you needed a big idea too, something that would drive these people to forward and keep them following you. Hannibal's big idea was to crush the Romans. His lifelong mission had begun, and he planned his campaign of hatred. The dominant feature of his strategy was to be the acquisition of allies. Neither Carthage nor Rome could ever hope to expand their territories without the support of Mediterranean countries. Each force greedily coveted the land that lay between them. In 219 BC, Hannibal attacked Secuntum in Spain a city with strong connections to Rome. This attack lit the match that was to ignite one of the most extraordinary campaigns in military history. Saguntum fell. Rome was furious and demanded the 29-year-old Hannibal surrender. When he refused, war and Carthage was declared. It was 218 BC and the Second Punic War had begun. Hannibal was now pitched against one of the mightiest forces on earth. There's no doubt that Hannibal would have realized that, that war with Rome was a very, very serious undertaking indeed. Just before the war began, uh, it's reckoned that Rome had roughly 700,000 uh, infanteers from which to draw their armies from. I mean, Rome could put army after army after army into the field against Hannibal. 
But it was not war with the Romans that was Hannibal's most immediate problem. It was geography. Rome was a thousand miles away from Spain. Getting there and avoiding Roman sea power in the Mediterranean would mean crossing two mountain ranges, the Pyrenees and the Alps. Hannibal was about to attempt one of the most extraordinary journeys in ancient history. Hannibal, unusually for Carthaginian generals, was, was a risk taker. Uh, and he was willing to pay the costs and take the risks of crossing the Alps to outflank Rome and to actually engage Rome in what in, in modern terms would be seen as its centre of gravity, its hold on the Italian peninsula itself. He decided that the best time to do it was very late in the season when the Romans would be beginning to think, well, no one can cross the Alps now, it's too late, the snows are coming, no army is going to get across. And Hannibal, very cleverly, sees that that is the golden opportunity. It'll be difficult, it'll be uncomfortable, there'll be losses, but it's the moment to do it, and he strikes quickly and decisively. Hannibal of Carthage embarked on a campaign which was to capture the hearts and imaginations of artists, writers and filmmakers for centuries to come. He began his journey across the Alps in the winter of 218 BC with 90,000 infantry, 12,000 cavalry and 37 elephants. This was to be one of the most grueling endeavours ever undertaken by one man and thousands of mercenaries. It's almost impossible to understand how Hannibal's army followed him, given that they are actually mercenaries rather than Carthaginian citizens, unless you understand his charismatic uh, an extremely physical form of leadership. The morale of the men going over the Alps was seriously challenged. They're hungry, they're wet, increasingly cold, they're dispirited. Hannibal is suffering alongside them. Just like Alexander the Great in the mountains of Afghanistan, Hannibal suffers with his men. It wasn't just the physical hardship and treacherous terrain that the Carthaginians had to deal with. Certain parts of the route, the valleys are very narrow, the passes are very vulnerable, and the local tribes weren't exactly friendly. Panic could be created in the Carthaginian army, strung out through the passes uh, by such attacks. There's at least one instance uh, where there were major losses in the baggage train as animals panicked and plunged into a deep river gorge. It took Hannibal 15 days to cross the Alps. More than 30,000 of his troops and many of his elephants perished on the journey. Bodies littered the Alpine paths all the way back to France, but they had made it. They had reached Italy. The Romans were incredulous. They couldn't believe what Hannibal was up to. The Romans probably thought of Hannibal as an adventurer, a chancer, someone who was perhaps gambling Carthaginian power recklessly, someone who had forced the Romans to fight, and he was about to get smashed. The two sides clashed in northern Italy, first on the plains of the Ticino River, and then on the banks of the Trebia River. Both times, the Romans were soundly defeated. Hannibal was hungry for more strikes on the Romans. Victories furthered his cause, winning new allies and pushing him further and further towards his hated enemy. He goaded Rome by plundering his way through the Italian countryside, knowing full well the impact this would have. At this point, the Romans would have been wise to await reinforcements. They had already suffered unexpected losses at the hands of Hannibal, but the sight of the Carthaginians terrorizing their allies was too much. The Roman army was about to walk straight into one of Hannibal's legendary traps. The 30-year-old Carthaginian leader chose a lake in central Italy for his next clash with the Romans. It was perfect geography for what he had in mind. Hannibal is ahead of the Romans. He finds a place where his road runs along the side of a lake with mountains rising up all the way around and almost blocking off the road, narrow entry to the lakeside, a narrow exit.
on this particular place. And Hannibal places his men on the mountains, which will be above the mist, and he blocks the exit to the valley, and he places another unit to block the entrance once the Romans have entered this killing field. The Romans marched straight into Hannibal's trap and were completely unprepared for the ambush that came from the mountains above them. For the Romans, it, it would have been very chaotic, it would have been very, very frightening. You have evidence of, of Roman troops literally going and drowning in the lake rather than face you up to the Carthaginians. When the mist lifted, the full horror of the scene was revealed. 15,000 Romans were dead, and the Carthaginians were moving slowly among the bloody bodies, stripping them of weapons and armor. Hannibal's tactics had triumphed once again. Uh, he was an imaginative commander. Uh, many military commanders are sound rather than imaginative, but Hannibal was, uh, w w was imaginative. He, uh, he thought his way out of problems. So far, Hannibal had outwitted his enemy, but a new challenge came in the form of Quintus Fabius Maximus, a gifted Roman leader. Fabius decided that the best strategy for the Romans in confronting Hannibal was not to face him directly, but to try and bottle him up, to make it difficult to supply his army, to squeeze him gradually until Hannibal was squeezed out of Italy. Rome followed Fabius's plan and thought they finally had Hannibal just where they wanted him. But the Carthaginian general was about to spring his biggest surprise yet. Hannibal and his men had been plunging their way through Italy, undefeated, for nearly a year. They continued to burn villages and murder Roman officials in the hope of goading Rome into further conflict. But the Romans were biding their time. They were not about to suffer more humiliating defeats. Instead, they shadowed Hannibal and his men, looking for the right opportunity to attack. After months of cat-and-mouse maneuvers, the Romans finally thought they had Hannibal trapped in the floor of a deep valley cut off by a river in southern Italy. Surely there was no way the Carthaginian could extract himself from this situation. The Romans are up above, it's night time, and they suddenly see this great horde of lights surging up the hillside. Hannibal's getting away. Got to be stopped. So the Romans converge on where the lights are. only to find a great herd of cattle with burning torches attached to their horns. In the cover of night, Hannibal's men had tied burning sticks to a herd of oxen and sent them horns of flame towards Fabius's army. And at the same time, Hannibal and his army silently crept out of the valley by one of the unguarded exits and they're away. In Rome, there was deep concern. What was to be done about Hannibal Barker? Hannibal ad portus. This is a Latin saying that the Romans have often used. It means Hannibal is at the door. The fear of Hannibal became so great that it was said Roman parents would use it as a way to threaten their misbehaving children. If a child was bad, the parent would say that Hannibal was coming for them. This was the effect of Hannibal and the people of Rome. Rome's strategy of not confronting Hannibal had failed and the Senate now prepared for all-out war on a scale never seen before. 90,000 men were called up to do battle. Hannibal was now facing the full might of Rome. They've got this absolutely massive army, much bigger than Hannibal's. They've got confident commanders who have the backing of the Roman Senate to go and beat up Hannibal. And they appear to have got him where they want him, open ground where the Romans can deploy and outmaneuver, outflank Hannibal. So they are going to win. Yet again, Rome had underestimated Hannibal. The battle that was to follow has become a classic of its kind, a supreme example of a military genius at work, the perfectly fought battle, studied today at military academies all over the world. The two armies met at Cannae, 
a Roman supply depot 200 miles from Rome. It was 216 BC, over two years since Hannibal first arrived in Italy. As the Carthaginians assembled, they gazed at an army nearly twice their size. This was a daunting sight, even for Hannibal's mercenaries. But their loyalty was never in question. The essential thing that Hannibal's got going for him uh, uh, in leading up to the Battle of Cannae is the supreme confidence his soldiers have in his command and in his decision making. And uh, I, you have to understand that confidence to understand what the Carthaginians were willing to do at the battle, uh, which an army less confident in their commander uh, uh, would uh, be unwilling to do. The battle plan Hannibal had chosen was the simplest he had ever employed, but the results were to be as deadly as an atomic bomb. The tactics for the battle were to persuade the Romans to advance. And Hannibal did this by drawing up his battle line with very strong wings and a rather weaker center, so that the Romans advancing towards him would push forwards and Hannibal's center would move backwards into an arc. And gradually, they would be encircled until a vast chunk of the Roman army would be surrounded by Carthaginians who would then drive inwards. An enormous mass of over 60,000 men cutting and stabbing and crushed in against each other, increasingly less and less able to use their weapons effectively. There would have been confusion, chaos, panic in the Roman ranks. It passes from battle to slaughterhouse as the Carthaginians are essentially hacking down Romans who can no longer resist. Thousands and thousands of Roman soldiers and their allies being slaughtered as they stood. No escape. A realization that their leaders have let them down. Yet again, fourth time running, the Romans have been outmaneuvered, outthought by Hannibal and outfought by his men. Devastating. Of the estimated 80,000 Roman troops that started in battle, fewer than 10,000 survived the slaughter. Hannibal had lost only 6,000 men. His victory was overwhelming. In Rome, there was panic. The state was nearer to collapse than at any other time in its history. Approximately 70,000 of the finest Roman troops were dead and the rest taken prisoner. People even started to leave the city. Hannibal was under great pressure from his men to move quickly to take Rome, but he hesitated. You need to appreciate not only Hannibal's strategy, which is not a strategy of destroying Rome, but a strategy of detaching Rome from its allies. A strategy which would be harmed if he marched on Rome and it didn't work. It would throw away the fruits of victory, rather than actually enable them to uh, uh, be harvested. He saw, unlike many in his army, what was really important in the war, that he needed diplomatic gains, he needed to detach Roman allies, he needed to acquire friends for himself. What Hannibal didn't know was that, despite his victories, the decision not to march on Rome would mark a turning point in the campaign against his hated enemy. Once again, the Senate changed its strategy. Hannibal was to be contained rather than faced in open battle. Rome began a campaign to win back and hold on to her allies and slowly destroy Hannibal's grip on Italy. The Carthaginian army was now at the mercy of Rome's new policy. Hannibal and his men were forced to wander around the Italian countryside, running dangerously low on provisions and reinforcements, relentlessly hounded by Roman forces. In 208 BC, Hannibal's brother launched a rescue mission, bringing another army over the Alps. But he was soon defeated by the Romans. The first that Hannibal, down in the south of Italy, knows about what has gone on, and about the great disaster, the loss of this, these reinforcements, is when his brother's head is catapulted into his camp for him to see the announcement of the disaster of his dreams. 
Skirmishes continued. There were defeats on both sides, but Rome was making its strength felt. Hannibal now had a powerful new adversary in the form of Scipio Africanus, commander of the Roman armies in Spain. Seven years after the Battle of Cannae, Scipio conquered New Carthage, Hannibal's original base in Spain. The Roman advance towards Old Carthage in North Africa had begun. Hannibal was recalled to his hometown. He made a miraculous escape from southern Italy to meet the Romans at Zama, close to Carthage, for the battle which would finally decide the outcome of the war. Before battle commenced, an extraordinary episode occurred. In a field close to the Roman and Carthaginian camps, two riders meet and face each other. They are Scipio, the 35-year-old leader of the Roman army, and the 45-year-old Hannibal. The two gaze at each other in silent admiration. A brief discussion takes place before the enemies turn their horses and return to their camps to prepare for battle. The battle at Zama in 202 BC marked the end of Hannibal's lifelong quest to crush the Romans. The Carthaginians were defeated, and a year later, Carthage signed a peace treaty with Rome. This was the end of the Second Punic War. Hannibal had not been home for 35 years. He became a chief magistrate and worked hard to bring about change under the new atmosphere of peace with Rome. But the Carthaginian hero was no longer welcome in his hometown. Accusations against him by political enemies were rife, and he was soon forced into exile. The last dozen years of Hannibal's life are spent in exile at royal courts in the Eastern Mediterranean. He's a respected, advisor to various kings, he's a military leader, especially in action against the Romans, but there's always the sense that the Romans are going to get their man. Hannibal was finally trapped by the Romans in Bithynia, northwestern Turkey, in 182 BC, 34 years after his victory at Cannae. This time there was no escape. Rather than suffer more humiliation, he took his own life. He was 65. Aged nine, Hannibal Barker swore an oath that he would hate the Romans. In the years that followed, he devoted his life to the destruction of Rome. He remained undefeated in Italy for 16 years and annihilated some of the greatest Roman armies ever fielded for battle. Hannibal is, is a, an inspirational figure because the sheer ingenuity with which he leads his army and the sheer personal example with which he leads his army he, in many ways embodies the ideal combination of leader and very, very cunning general. It's understandable that the modern commander might wish to be seen as a modern Hannibal. Hannibal.